Hey, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's John, and uh, I hope everyone is doing well. Uh, I apologize for just being in my t-shirt today. I, uh, um, like many around the country, I uh, got a text last night from uh, my employer, uh, highly encouraging people to to work from home for the next two weeks. So. I already work from home a couple of days a week uh, as it is, and so um, it's really not too big of a deal for me. Um, so my, my kids uh, are, are gone, so I figure I'd get a quick video in before they get back and, and make a bunch of noise. So I did have three work trips scheduled over the next uh, four or five weeks that have all canceled, So, uh, which is a good thing. But uh, hopefully you are all staying safe. Um, thank you for all you do, especially for the the um, all the uh, the practitioners, the nurses out there that I'm sure um, are working uh, arduously um, to to help um, uh, curb the uh, the effects of this. So, uh, anyways, uh, of course, uh, school goes on and life goes on, and and we have to learn how to deal with this the best we can. So we will continue on in our studies of healthcare legal uh, and ethical issues. Um, and uh, and we'll do that. So I, I know many, uh, many universities are, are going into a, an online format. Fortunately, we're already used to that format. So we'll just we'll just keep on uh, going as as we had planned. So um, this week, I, I want to uh, uh, discuss a couple of things from your text, um, and then, uh, uh, and then, if you have any questions, of course, I'm available and and please let me know. I did have a couple of people reach out to me on the that initial case uh, um, sort of case briefing or case study assignment. Um, which is great. Please, please reach out to me. I think that's a really important assignment because uh, it helps you sort of dissect the facts, the material issues, uh, or the material facts that present issues in the case. Um, you're going to need that as you engage in some some more in depth legal analysis in upcoming assignments. So uh, please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions about that or would like to discuss it. Uh, this week I want to talk a little bit about uh, professional responsibilities. Codes of conduct, um, uh, patient abandonment, and a little bit about privacy. So, uh, physicians, like all practitioners, I know that we have many in this class, are governed by some sort of state board, uh, some uh, of health or medicine could be a state medical board, or state nursing board, depending on the occupation uh, and the, and the license. Uh, every state has statutes, regulations that govern. Uh, what constitutes unprofessional conduct and when a physician may be disciplined. And, and every state has its own definition of what constitutes unprofessional unprof conduct. And usually it's a very long list of um, some very narrow and some very broad uh, types of behavior, or types of conduct that could constitute unprofessional conduct. Um, I, I've had uh, two cases in my career where I uh, represented a physician, both times a physician. Uh, one was a, a neurosurgeon and the other was a gastroenterologist uh, before the state licensing board for um, uh, for some sort of disciplinary, proposed disciplinary action. And um, of course, I can't go into detail on, on what, what that was, but um, uh, what I learned was those types of cases certainly make the best stories. Uh, very strange fact patterns in, in each of those cases. Um, you know, I, I guess my takeaway that I could pass on just from those two cases, very limited, admittedly very limited experience in, in, uh, in, in those types of cases that I have. Uh, but one is don't, first of all, don't lie to patients, don't lie to family members, don't uh, and this is all common sense stuff that you already know. Don't alter, falsify medical records. Uh, very important. Um, you know, you, you'd think uh, that would be common sense to everyone, but uh, but certainly don't do that because that all those cases, uh, all those facts were part of 
uh, disciplinary case in those two cases that I worked on. So um, very important. So um, and, and we're going to get into later. Uh, I mean, those are sort of legal codes of conduct. We're going to get into ethical codes of conduct a little bit later in the course uh, that govern uh, practitioner uh, behavior and, and conduct. Uh, in your text, uh, the next thing I want to talk about, in your text, there's some discussion about patient dumping uh, and the duty to treat indigent patients. And so we talked, I talked a little bit about this in that first week's video about sort of the conflation of ethical issues and legal issues where we as a society have determined that, hey, it's unethical. Um, and I think many people would say it's unethical for uh, you know, if someone who has was really experiencing a medical emergency to show up at an ER uh, and and not get the treatment that he or she needs simply because of the fact that they're indigent or they don't have insurance or they can't pay or they don't have enough, whatever the case may be. So that's uh, so that sort of ethical mindset or what we, we we as a collective society deem to be ethical has transferred into the legal side through the passing of uh, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. So if you work in an ER, if you have, you're, I'm sure you're very familiar with EMTALA, uh, which um, <clears throat> prohibits um, you prohibits an ER from turning away patients simply because they are not insured or for any reason. If they show up with a medical emergency, they're required to provide stabilizing, uh, provide a medic, uh, meaning, uh, medical screening and, uh, and provide stabilizing care without any questions about insurance or anything like that. So, um, so that's very important. The patient dumping piece is it prohibits the ER from dumping those patients onto another hospital because of, for the same reasons. And so uh, neither one is acceptable under EMTALA. Yeah, and, and of course, because uh, lawyers are just really great at uh, sort of <laughs> sort of questioning the entire legal landscape of, of, of any law, um, you know, the question becomes, what is an emergency department? Um, what is a meaningful uh, screening? What is stabilizing care? And so there are all kinds of questions, and there are t there's tons of case law. There have been many, many court cases on EMTALA that that sort of guide and direct this this uh, this area. EMTALA is a federal law, not a state law, um, and and there are a lot of federal rules, guidance, and case law about this question, of course. Uh, okay, so enough about that. I want to talk about patient abandonment. This is actually pretty timely for me because. Uh, I have a client, in, um, a client that is a uh, three physician surgical group that that they're talking about uh, dissolving uh, and kind of going their separate ways. And so questions uh, come up about, you know, what do we do with the medical records? Uh, you know, how do we handle the situation with the EMR? Uh, and what about these patients that, you know, these physicians don't intend to, I mean, they're surgeons, so it's a little bit different than sort of the, a primary care practice where, a, visit, uh, a patient would come in on a more frequent basis. But uh, nonetheless, um, you know, you never as a physician or uh, you never want to be uh, at risk for any sort of patient abandonment claim. And um, it is a form of medical malpractice or negligence. The elements are very similar. Um, it, it occurs essentially when a physician terminates that physician patient relationship without the proper notice or uh or transferring that patient to the care of someone else so um uh, there this is a this would be a state law issue uh and, and we'll make that distinction throughout the, the course like mtala is a federal law uh patient abandonment negligence medical malpractice uh those things that we're studying those are all state law issues and so uh, there are generally five elements for a patient abandonment uh, claim. Of course, it's going to vary from state to state on the specifics, but generally uh, these are the five elements. Number one, uh, health care treatment was unreasonably discontinued. Two, the termination of health care was contrary to the patient's will or without the patient's knowledge. Uh, three, the health care provider failed to arrange for care by another appropriate skilled health care provider. Four, the healthcare provider should have reasonably foreseen 
that harm to the patient would arise from the termination of the care. So sort of this uh, that causation piece that we've been learning about uh, with medical negligence is kind of a similar element. And finally, the patient um, actually suffered harm or loss as a result of the discontinuance of care. So the actual damages or harm, very similar to the elements of the uh, medical negligence that we're studying in this class. So again, governed by state law, each state generally has laws requiring some notice to be given. Um, some state laws define the, the actual number of days notice uh, that has to be given. Uh, pretty standard is 30. Again, like I advise these physicians, standard is 30. However, if there are patients who, because of their current condition, they may be more vulnerable, uh, maybe not for surgeons, but maybe for primary care or like, like an oncologist or a nephrologist or so, some sort of specialty provider that's treating a chronic illness may require more notice or may actually require some sort of transfer to another physician um, uh, that can that can treat the patient. So it just sort of depends, but but the, the, based on those facts and circumstances, those are the uh, elements that we want to we would want to uh, uh, mitigate risk for. So you know these are these are some of the types of actions that will lead to liability um, for abandonment of patient patients based on some court cases that I that I. Uh, so uh, things like premature discharge of the patient by the physician, failure of the physician to provide proper instructions before discharging the patient, uh, a statement by a physician to the patient that the physician will no longer treat the patient, again, without notice and all, all, the, all those other elements being met, refusal of the physician to respond to calls or to further attend the patient, and the physicians leaving the patient after surgery or failing to follow up on post-surgical care. So. Those are all examples of what may be considered, if those elements are met, um, patient abandonment. I want to briefly touch on privacy, because only briefly, because we're gonna we're going to dig into it more next week. Our discussion question for module four is a great one, and it's a, it's with respect to privacy. Uh, but I want to I want to touch on it a little bit. Um, Private, uh, you know, HIPAA generally, many of you, if not all of you, are very familiar with HIPAA, and that essentially says you can't use or disclose protected health information unless an exception applies. There are three very common exceptions, and that is for the treatment of the patient, for payment, and for healthcare operations. And there are a variety of others like law enforcement and uh, there, there are quite a bit judicial proceedings, subpoenas, things like that. There are many others that are not, aren't necessarily mandatory. They are permissive. So, um, uh, so that, that that's that's an important distinction there. And so, it's important to for you to be familiar, obviously, with HIPAA privacy issues. Again, we're going to get more into that next week. Uh, there are, the HIP, HIPAA is generally uh, broke it up into three different rules. There's the privacy rule that uh, is essentially what I just told you in terms of the use and disclosure of PHI. The security rule that talks about the security of data, security of PHI requires covered entities to uh, have the necessary safeguards, technical, administrative, uh, and physical safeguards in place to make sure that that PHI is protected. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to post a link. Um, I, I tell you, sometimes government uh, agency websites are, are terrible and are, are really hard to navigate. The, the agency that enforces HIPAA, uh, I didn't mention the third rule for HIPAA. The third one is the enforcement rule. And, and that's where the agency that uh, enforces HIPAA, which is the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Civil Rights, or OCR for short, uh, they, uh, their agency website on HIPAA is really great and they, they very easy to navigate, very clear and distinct. They have a great list of FAQs, uh, that are in some cases really specific and very helpful. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to post a link, uh, to that, uh, so you can take a look at just kind of peruse to that website and, and it's a great resource if you have a question about HIPAA. 
Uh, you'll also see that the penalties assessed by OCR for violation, you know, that one of the biggest, if not the biggest, was the $16 million sanction to Anthem. Uh, that was in October, which I think at the time, and it still may be the biggest breach in 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 history for with respect to HIPAA. So that was back in October of 2019. Uh, an important uh, thing that we'll get into is there's no private right of action under HIPAA, meaning if you are a patient and your your uh, protected health information was inappropriately or uh, used or disclosed, or there was some sort of breach and your PHI was involved in that, HIPAA does not give you the right to sue the hospital or the whoever has your PHI and causes the breach. Um, it allows uh, penalties and sanctions to be assessed by the federal government, but it doesn't allow you to sue. There are some, there there are uh, state privacy laws. Each state has typically has its own state privacy laws that may or may not give you the right to to sue and collect damages. Sometimes the state laws only allow the state attorney general to sue and uh, and assess a fine or a penalty. Um, so it just kind of depends on the state where you are. But uh, it's important to note that HIPAA does not give you that right. So. Uh, we've come a long way in this country with respect to privacy laws and rules, and uh, and there's still you know the, the law is is uh, seems like it's always a little bit behind on on the tech uh, behind of the technology, which is the technology moves so fast that's that seems right. Um, so it's always catching up, but uh, that that's all I have. Uh, the only other thing is remember as you engage in these assignments if you go, as we go through the legal analysis the legal components of this Itraldi case remember uh, that legal analysis method of of the Iraq the Iraq method IRAC so remember the issue this is very important uh, state the issue what is the rule what it, apply the facts and give me your conclusion so that that is the most I, I don't I'm less concerned about the conclusion. I'm more concerned about how you get there. Um, if you have any questions on that, please let me know. Remember, medical negligence has four elements, each of which has its own rule, each of which needs to be analyzed in order for you to come to your conclusion. Um, and that's why this this first case on the Itraldi, uh, or this first assignment on the Itraldi case was really important because it, it helped you, it kind of forced you to go through the case uh, gather the specific facts, um, dissect those facts, understand what facts raise issues, what are what's material, what's not material, um, to help prepare you for that first draft that will require some level of legal analysis. The power uh, of any legal analysis is in the use of specific facts, drawing on those facts, applying them to the rule to draw a reasonable conclusion. So if your analysis is reasonable, you're weaving in facts, you're applying the right rule, uh, your conclusion is always going to be reasonable. So it's not about right or wrong. It's about what's reasonable. So uh, that's all I have this week. Uh, again, please stay safe um, and uh, stay healthy. And um, please let me know if you need anything. I'm, I'm here and available. And I hope you have a great week. Take care. Bye.